Good afternoon. Today I want to talk about putting viruses together. We've gone through the reproductive cycle. We've talked about replicating genomes, and now we're going to put genomes and proteins and lipids in some cases together. We're going to make virus particles in a process that we call assembly. And this almost brings us to the end of the reproductive cycle of viruses. We have one more discussion next week where we'll talk about the effects of viruses on cells. And then we'll move into talking about pathogenesis. Now, if you look at a virus particle, at the end of this lecture, I want you to be able to look at a particle and know exactly how it's assembled. That is the goal here. And it's not very difficult. We're just going to consider the two major types of virus symmetry, the icosahedral symmetry, and you can pick them out here, and viruses with helical symmetry or icosahedral symmetry, but encased in membranes. So two broad categories, icosahedral and membrane-encased viruses. We're going to look at how these are assembled today. We're going to go over the principles as usual. And I want to start with this slide, which, again, here's our two kinds of viruses we're going to talk about, naked and enveloped. There are a series of steps that every virus particle has to go through in order to complete assembly. It starts with uh, the formation of individual proteins, of course, those folding into structural units and eventually forming the capsid. We'll see how that happens. So the first step is just assembly of the shell of the particle. And we've talked about the principles of symmetry, so that should make sense to you. Another important step is packaging of the nucleic acid into the particle. What gives the specificity that makes it so that viruses only package viral nucleic acid and not cellular nucleic acid? In most cases, with few exceptions, there's very little non-viral nucleic acid in virus particles. And we're going to talk today about what we know about what controls that. And then for many viruses, that's the last step. And we go to release of the virus particles from the host cell. We'll talk a little bit at the end about that step. But for viruses, of course, that have an envelope, they have an additional step. They have to acquire an envelope. And then they are released from the host cell as well. Sometimes, as you'll see, the virus particles actually mature outside of the host cell. The vast majority mature in the cell or as they're leaving the cell, but a few mature after they, in fact, leave the cell. Now, as every other step in the viral reproductive cycle is dependent on host cell machinery, assembly is also, and these are some of the things that viruses require from the host cell. They include cellular chaperones. These are cell proteins that assist in assembly reactions. There are, of course, transport systems to move virus subunits and virus particles around in the cell, very much like during entry. We use transport system. We use them on exit as well. The secretory pathway to move glycoproteins to the plasma membrane, nuclear import, nuclear export, all of these and more play roles in virus assembly. So even though a lot of the reactions in assembly happen spontaneously due to the sequence of the viral proteins, the entire assembly process does not by any means happen without the assistance of the cell. Now let's talk a little bit about transport. Here is a diagram on the left uh, showing, again, remember the idea that the cell is crowded, things do not diffuse in the cell, they move around by active transport processes. Long distance movement requires energy. Motor proteins on cytoskeletal tracts, which we talked about before during entry, are required. And of course, they're also required during exit as well. If a virus particle forms in the nucleus, it's not going to just diffuse to the plasma membrane to get out. It's going to move along motor pathways, the cytoskeletal tracts, just like they do when they come in. And on the right is an experiment to illustrate this. This is a cell infected with vesicular stomatitis virus. And on the top, the viral nucleoprotein, the, the protein that coats the viral genome, is visualized as yellow, I guess, with an antibody against the protein. This visualization shows that the nucleoprotein is likely coating the viral RNA. 
it is, goes from all the way from near the nucleus, which is stained blue, we're staining DNA with a dye, DAPI dye, uh, all the way to the plasma membrane. And those nucleoprotein RNA subassemblies or nucleocapsids are moving to the plasma membrane from the nucleus via motor transport pathways, via the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is stained in red using an antibody to tubulin. So you can see the cytoskeletal network, and those are the tracks on which viruses move in and out of the cell. Now in the bottom panel, we have treated this infected cell with a drug called nacodazole. Nacodazole disrupts microtubules. And you can see the red staining reflects that. They're now not any more nice filaments. They're just a mass of protein. They're all disrupted. And the nuclear protein is hung up in the cytoplasm in little clumps, if you will. It's not, no longer able to get to the cell surface uh, because the microtubule network has been disrupted. And in fact, in these cells treated with nacodazole to disrupt the microtubule, you can't make any infectious virus particles because they can't get to the plasma membrane, which they have to do in order to mature, as you'll see in a bit. So that's just one example of how these transport pathways are important. Another general principle is that typically where viruses assemble, whether it be a subcomponent or a main component, they do so in concentrated regions because nothing happens fast in dilute solutions. So viral components are often visible because of this. They concentrate in factories or inclusions. So many years ago, when we first learned about virus infections and pathologists were looking at tissue sections from people who had viral infections, they would often see in the cells via a light microscope these visible bodies, they called them inclusion bodies. We now know that those are sites of assembly of virus particles. These occur because assembly occurs more efficiently when all the components are concentrated in one area than being all over the cytoplasm. And I have two examples of such concentration here. One is how in cells infected with poliovirus, a viral protein induces the formation of double membrane vesicles. And you can see them on the lower left electron micrograph. This is a cell after about four hours of polio infection, and it's full of virus particles. Those are the dark dots in this image. But these larger double membrane vesicles, these are actually formed via the autophagy pathway. You know, when cells get stressed, one of the things they do is they induce autophagy where they form these double membrane vesicles containing the cytoplasm, which they then throw out of the cell. The idea is that they're recycling it. And so polio infection induces these, but the virus actually replicates its RNA on the surface of these double membrane vesicles. And most of RNA viruses do that. They, as I mentioned when we talked about RNA synthesis, they induce the formation of some kind of membranous vesicle. And on the surface of that, they do their RNA synthesis, and it's probably to make it more efficient. So that's one example of a concentrating a reaction. Another one is on the right, and this is a neuron of an uh, animal that had rabies after a rabies virus infection. You can see this darkly staining inclusion body in the cell and in some cells around it. These are called Negri bodies by the pathologist who first discovered them. And these, are, these inclusions often have names named after the people who first found them. We now know that this is where the nucleocapsid of rabies virus which again is very much like vesicular stomatitis virus where it's assembling and then of course it will be transported to the plasma membrane by the motor microtubule cytoskeleton to uh, mature at the plasma membrane. A concentration is done in order to increase the efficiency of reactions and there the nucleocapsid assembly, the protein, protein and protein RNA interactions happen faster when they are concentrated. Now another principle is that viral proteins just like cell proteins have addresses in fact, one of the first people who discovered addresses died a couple of days ago. Do you know about that? You ever hear of Gunter Blobel? Do you ever hear of a signal sequence and the N-terminus of a peptide? That's a kind of address which targets the protein to the endoplasmic reticulum. Well, he discovered that. He was right here in New York at Rockefeller, and he discovered signals or addresses, as you would call them. And there are lots of signals on proteins to send them to different places. And of course, cell proteins have signals and viral proteins do as well. For example, there are membrane targeting signals like the signal sequence discovered by Blobel. 
at the end terminus of proteins that are destined for the secretory pathway. Uh, there are also fatty acid modifications you'll see that have a similar effect. They can target proteins to the plasma membrane without having to go through the secretory pathway. There are also signals that tell a cell to keep a protein in the membrane instead of letting it go to the surface. So they're called membrane retention signals. There are nuclear localization signals that get proteins into the nucleus. And of course, there are nuclear export signals as well. So there are two examples on this slide of a nuclear localization sequence, an NLS. Here on the top is what we call a simple one. It's just a series of hydrophobic, basic hydrophobic amino acids. So we have a proline hydrophobic, three to seven basic, and then another hydrophobic. And that's all it takes to get a protein targeted to the nucleus. This is recognized by the import machinery of the nucleus and taken in. And most proteins can get in through the nuclear pores. So that's, that's not a problem. This, this particular NLS is on the SV40T antigen. Remember, this is a protein made in the cytoplasm, first protein to be made when that virus infects a cell. And then it has to get in the nucleus to stimulate DNA replication, uh, among other things. And so that's the NLS for that. And then we have more complicated uh, nuclear localization signals. The point is they're pretty simple and they're modular. You could take this simple hydrophobic, basic hydrophobic sequence and put it in another protein that never goes in the nucleus and it will go in. So it's transferable. Here's an example of localization of proteins to the nucleus. We've seen this already for T antigen. Here are two other examples. Here is the influenza virus nucleoprotein. This is being made like all other proteins. Every protein is made in the cytoplasm. That's where the ribosomes are and everything else you need to make proteins. It's made in the cytoplasm, but it has to go into the nucleus in order to bind to the viral RNA. That's where the viral RNA is made uh, in the nucleus. So it has nuclear import signals to get it in, a nuclear localization signal. And that's a nuclear pore. Uh, the machinery recognizes the NLS and then it brings it through the pore. We also have here a couple of other examples. Here is the SV40 capsid subunit, which again is assembled in the cytoplasm. It consists of five copies of VP1 in a pentamer formation and a couple of other minor proteins. They have NLSs, they go in the nucleus via that. And again, that's because the SV40 DNA is replicating in the nucleus and the virus particles are assembled there. Except for pox viruses and the giant viruses, all the DNA viruses we've talked about pretty much start to assemble in the nucleus. And then we have on this an adenovirus protein, which is actually the hexon. Remember the capsid is made of hexons and pentons. This hexon is made as a monomer in the cytoplasm. It, it, it uh, forms hexons and those are important because again, adenovirus DNA replicates in the nucleus and that's where the virus particles are assembled. Another example of localization, this to the plasma membrane. And this of course happens for envelope viruses that need to put glycoproteins in the viral envelope. You can't just have an envelope or a membrane around the virus genome. You have to have a glycoprotein to give it specificity. These are typically synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum. So proteins have an N-terminal signal sequence which tells the ribosome to bind to the endoplasmic reticulum. And the protein, as it's translated, is translocated to the lumen of the ER. You can see these red proteins here. And then they all have transmembrane signals which anchor them uh, in the ER. And then they move to the surface. Their destination is the plasma membrane for this particular virus because that's where the virus particle will form. And those proteins move by the secretory pathway to the surface. And what that means is a, a vesicle will pinch off from the ER carrying these proteins. It will then fuse with the Golgi and move through the stacks of the Golgi by a series of fusions and vesicle formations and then be released by the Golgi and move to the plasma membrane. And all this movement again occurs on cytoskeleton microtubules as shown here. And finally the last vesicle will fuse with the plasma membrane. That puts the glycoproteins in the plasma membrane, and then it will assemble with the viral genome in a process called budding, which we'll look at a bit later. Now, another key principle in assembly is that we don't just make the whole virus at once. We make sub-assemblies. It's sort of like a um, 
an assembly line for a car, right? The, the components move down and people attach things to it. Then at the end, it's all done. You don't put the whole car together. And it's the same with viruses. So you make subassemblies and you put them together. A subassembly is nothing more than an intermediate kind of structure. And we believe this happens because it, it gives you an orderly pathway to make a complicated virus particle rather than putting it all together at once. But importantly, we think it provides quality control to the process, uh, something for many years which was lacking in the American automotive industry, quality control. You've heard of lemons, of course. Well, viruses make lemons as well, but these are reversible. They get to a certain point, and if the assembly is not right, it can be reversed, and that's what you get from a subassembly. You make a capsid that's not quite right. It doesn't go through the whole process and get put onto the virus particle. It's reversed and taken out of the assembly. So on the right is an example of a assembly of a bacteriophage. It's a more complicated virus in that it has an icosahedral head and helical tail and some tail fibers attached to it. And these are all assembled separately and put together. So you can see here the tail is assembled on the left side. And these numbers are actually the individual proteins that go together to form these structures. So the first thing that happens is the base plate is formed. All these proteins go to form the base plate. And we looked at a structure of a base plate earlier. And then you add to the base plate this sort of tubular structure around which forms the helical tail. And then another piece goes on top. And in the meantime, the capsid is being assembled. This is an icosahedral capsid. So a number of proteins go into forming that. Eventually, it gets put together with the tail. So you form a tail, you form a capsid. And then finally, you also form tail fibers. And through a number of steps, by the addition of a variety of proteins, and then they all join at the end. So you head, tail come together, and then tail fibers. So that's what I mean by subassemblies. It allows you to do an assembly line type of putting together a virus particle. And if at any step, if you screw up with the tail, you just get rid of it, you don't attach it. And there are mechanisms that ensure that we don't put together defective particles. And here are some ways that subassemblies are made in virus infected cells. First on the top, many viruses make individual proteins and stick them together. So the top we're looking at SV40, the pentamer, which is the basic, one of the basic subunits of the virus capsid. This is made by simply making individual proteins. You make VP1, translation on ribosomes, of course. You put five VP1s together to form pentamer, and then you make another minor protein called VP23, which ends up in the center there, as you can see. So it's a subassembly, obviously, because then you, you need a lot of those to, to build the capsid. And so this part is made first by individual proteins. You can also use a polyprotein strategy shown in the middle, and that's for poliovirus. Now, remember, we talked about viral RNA genomes where the genome is a single RNA molecule, and to get a lot of proteins from that single RNA, one of the strategies is to make a long polyprotein and chop it up. So that's what's happening here. These ribosomes are translating the first part of poliovirus RNA, and they're synthesizing the first proteins, which are the capsid proteins, VP1, 2, 3, and 4. So these are synthesized as a precursor. They fold into the right conformation that's going to be in the virus particle. And then a protease cleaves, a viral protease cleaves the bonds between the capsid proteins. And then this ends up being a structural unit which can be used to build virus particles. We'll take a look at that, the whole scheme of that in a moment. But that's an example of making a subassembly from a polyprotein precursor. So we have individual proteins or polyprotein precursor. On the bottom is an example of making a subassembly but using a chaperone. I want to make that a principle as well because although a lot of these proteins look like they're just popping together automatically, and they can do that. And it turns out that often chaperones are used. It could be viral or cellular proteins, which does nothing more than accelerate the assembly process and make it less error prone. So at the bottom is an example of the formation of the hexon. It's a trimer of three proteins called protein two. And these are translated independently, of course, 
uh, and associate into a trimer, and that will go to form the hexon arrays in the virus particle. But this trimerization is assisted by a viral protein, the L4 protein, which acts as a chaperone. It accelerates the process and makes sure it is not error prone. And so this is typical for many of these assembly reactions, although they can occur without assistance. Assistance is often provided in form of a chaperone. And here are some assembly reactions that are assisted by known cellular chaperones. They're being discovered more and more as we look for them. On the top, for example, that's the uh, capsid of a bacteriophage, just the head, of course, not the tail. This is made up of individual subunits, uh, but their assembly into the capsid is facilitated by a rather large cellular protein called GROW-EL, which is a known chaperone for other cell proteins, and it also helps assist in the assembly of the capsid. We know this because we can take it out of cells, we can take the GROW-EL out of cells and the capsids form much more slowly and with more errors. The folding of the poliovirus uh, protein, remember it's made as a polyprotein precursor and it folds. I said in the previous slide, it just folds. Well, it can fold on its own, but the folding is much more efficient when it's done in the presence of cellular chaperones like HSC70 and P23. The same goes for the formation of the uh, shell of retroviruses. Remember we learned last time that the retroviral genome, the two RNA strands, are encased in a shell composed of a capsid protein, and it's in brown here, and a membrane protein, which is in blue. And this forms in a stepwise fashion by the assembly of subunits. You see here a subunit of, of GAG protein. It's the, actually the GAG precursor, which contains the M protein, the capsid, and the nuclear protein. And these assemble to form a growing crescent, which eventually forms a shell and the virus particle. This all happens as the particle is budding, by the way, which you'll see later. All of this assembly, the folding of GAG into the right structure and the assembly is assisted by uh, a cellular chaperone called Tri-C. And even SV40 uh, likes to have chaperones. A single pentamer shown here, and its incorporation into the virus particle is assisted by a cellular chaperone called HSC70. And look, also large T is also participating in this. And this is an energy dependent reaction. So this is a viral and a cellular chaperone participating. And I show you large T because this protein has so many functions. I told you uh, uh, some time ago, it's, it stimulates DNA replication, it stimulates transcription. It kicks the cells into mitosis by sequestering RB. And here it's a chaperone. Amazing number of functions packed into this one protein. That's genetic economy, if there ever was such a thing. So here's how poliovirus assembles. I want to take you through the entire assembly pathway for a few viruses that are made by sequential assembly. Again, a sequential assembly means you do things in a set order. You make subassemblies and put them together. So here we have poliovirus infecting a cell. It binds its receptor. There's a conformational change in the particle that allows the formation of a pore, and the RNA can come out into the cytoplasm. It's translated by ribosomes. You get that long polyprotein precursor, which, as it's made, is being cleaved. And one of the cleavage products is that 5S structural unit that we just described. It folds nicely. It's assisted by a chaperone. And then five of those come together to make pentamers. Those are called 14S capsid pentamers. So now we have five structural units. So this is an assembly line. First you make a 5S, a monomer, a subunit, then you make pentamers. And then these pentamers bind the RNA and form the capsid. And you take a dozen pentamers and put them to form a capsid, and that is then cleaved and released from the cell. So you start with the single protein being made, the protomer, the single subunit, the 5S structural unit, they form pentamers, and then the final virus particle. And again, the ability to do this is built into the sequence of the viral protein. This can happen on its own. A chaperone just makes it faster. Here's another example of a sequential capsid assembly, but it's a different kind of virus with some twists that are very interesting. This is a herpes virus. Now, herpes virus is a virus that 
replicates its DNA in the nucleus. Remember, we talked about that last time. The linear DNA goes into the nucleus. It's circularized, and then you do rolling circle replication to make genomes. So they're in the nucleus, so we have to make capsids in the nucleus as well. And these are big capsids made up of a lot of proteins. So all the proteins are made in the cytoplasm. They're imported through the nuclear pore. They all have NLSs. They include pentamers, hexamers, these, these Y proteins called triplexes. Look at this, even the portal gets imported. The portal is made in the cytoplasm, gets made, and remember, that's gonna be stuck onto one of the five-fold axes of symmetry, and that's where the DNA will go in, in this process, and then it's gonna come out when it infects the new cell. But this capsid is very large, and so it doesn't just assemble on its own, it actually assembles on a scaffold which is shown in this upper diagram. This scaffold is made of all viral proteins. That's what these squiggly things are here, the pre-22 and the 24-21. They assemble a scaffold. It's, it's an internal scaffold, though. It's not like a building scaffold on the outside. And then the, the capsid forms around it. I guess it's very big, and this helps it form efficiently. However, the scaffold fills the interior of the capsid, which precludes you having DNA in there, so that's not good. So you have to get rid of the scaffold, and the brilliant part of this is that when the capsid is complete, somehow that sends a signal to the scaffold. The scaffold has a protease embedded into it, which is not active until it receives this signal from the, the capsid being complete. And you kind of see that here. It goes from a circular structure to an icosahedral structure. That's just to signify that some difference is transmitting a signal. The protease becomes active. It chews up the scaffold into small peptides, which can then go out of the portal. And then the genomic DNA is put through the portal, and we end it with that there. So this is neat because it, you, you make this scaffold to assist in the assembly of the capsid, and then you provide a mechanism to get rid of it, which, of course, you have to do. And that virus will then get out of the nucleus and eventually uh, leave the cell. All right, so those are sequential assemblies where you take intermediates and put them together and eventually put them all together at the end to make a virus. We have another kind of assembly which I call concerted assembly. And this is different because there's a step where the virus particle is formed. There are some intermediate structures, as you will see, but here we have the virus forming all at once. So we define concerted assembly as the virus particles assemble only in association with the viral genome. Now, influenza virus particles are enveloped, and they form by budding. This is what we call budding, where the, the membrane begins to pinch out from the plasma membrane and eventually completely pinches off, and you have a virus particle. That's what I mean by budding. Uh, influenza virus replication is a bit complicated because the proteins are made in the cytoplasm, but the RNA is made in the nucleus, and that's where the nucleocapsid forms. Remember, the virus has eight RNA segments, and each of them is a nucleocapsid with RNA bound to protein. And so in the nucleus, the RNA genome is replicating. Those are these kind of olive-colored RNAs at the upper right. They're coated with protein. Proteins, of course, have to be made in the cytoplasm and brought in to coat these RNAs. Uh, and then one of the other proteins that's going to be in the virus particle, M1, it's this blue protein here, also binds to the nucleocapsid. And that has to get out. And the way it does so is by another viral protein called NEP, which stands for nuclear export protein. This has an export sequence in it. The RNA doesn't have any export sequence. Nucleic acids don't have such import or export sequences, in fact. But they can bind to proteins that provide that function. So here, this is providing an export function. So this ribonucleoprotein can get out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And these then go to the plasma membrane. I'll talk about in a moment how the targeting occurs. So now this is, again, a ribonucleoprotein. We're just showing one segment for simplicity. It's bound to this M1 protein. It goes to the plasma membrane, and that assembly of course, with eight RNAs in it, begins to bud off. And then you have the final virus particle. And there you have uh, the RNAs inside. And the, the blue M proteins actually form a shell that give the membrane some support. But those blue membrane proteins originated uh, in the nucleus. So this is the step when the virus particle forms. It's basically the RNA 
and the membrane together bud off, forming the virus particles. You do have some sequential assembly of, say, the ribonucleoprotein, but in the end, the virus particle is made by this step, and that's why we call it concerted. Let's take a closer look at one of the glycoproteins of influenza virus. This is going to come back later in, in this course when we talk about pathogenesis. It's very important. So remember, the influenza virus particle is envelope. It has three different proteins in it, in the membrane. It has a hemagglutinin, which is this club-shaped molecule. It has a neuraminidase, which is orange. Of course, the hemagglutinin is what's attaching to the sialic acid on the cell receptor. The neuraminidase removes sialic acid. We'll talk about that later. It has a very interesting function. And then there's also an ion channel here, which we talked about uh, during entry. This actually allows protons to get into the interior of the particle to release the ribonucleoprotein. The HA, remember, is a trimer on the surface of the particle. It's perpendicular to the viral membrane, type 1 fusion protein. Here's a schematic, a linear schematic of the HA at the bottom, which lays out all the features of this molecule. So here's the membrane. It could be viral or cellular membrane. There's a little cytoplasmic sequence. There's a transmembrane domain. And then we have the part of the HA that's outside. And it's shown in a linear fashion, not the real structure, to show you all the different elements in it. So first of all, it's highly glycosylated. You can see by these Y signals here, there's sugars attached to it. it has a number of disulfide bonds in, shown in yellow. And at the end terminus, there's a signal sequence. The signal sequence, of course, sends this protein to the endoplasmic reticulum. It starts it on its transport to the cell surface. Once that gets into the ER lumen, it's cleaved off. And we don't see this in the final virus particle. It's cleaved off by a host protein. There in the middle is this green sequence labeled fusion peptide. That, of course, is going to be what fuses the virus with the endosome membrane in the process we talked about some time ago. And as this protein is first made, this fusion peptide is buried. Not only is it by the bottom near the membrane, but it doesn't have a free end terminus. That free end terminus has to be generated by cleavage. Cleavage is, is shown by this orange arrowhead. Only when the HA is cleaved can it, the fusion peptide be exposed when the pH drops in the endosome. And then remember the fusion peptide flips up and goes into the endosome membrane. And that cleavage can happen either in the cell or extracellularly. We'll talk more about that later. Now, when this is cleaved, you might think, well, doesn't this part of the HA up here fall off? No, because it's got disulfide bonds. In particular, that long one holds the two pieces, the two red pieces together, so that even with it cleaved, they will stay intact on the cell surface. And so that is the anatomy of the HA. And just because you're going to see these later, the whole HA protein is called HA0. That's the uncleaved form. When it's cleaved at this fusion peptide, it gives you HA1 and 2. So we'll talk about that later on. Now I want to just take you through how this protein is made and sent to the plasma membrane. So again, the mRNA encoding the HA binds ribosomes, and because there is a signal sequence on the protein that's made, it targets those ribosomes to the ER, and the protein as it's made, it's shown in red, gets translocated into the ER lumen. It's because of the signal sequence. Signal sequence, of course, is taken off. You end up with this protein shown on the right here. You have uh, most of the HA with those disulfide bonds. It's in the lumen of the ER, and then there's the little cytoplasmic portion on the other side, the transmembrane domain. This protein then moves through the secretory pathway. It moves out of the ER by being transported in vesicles, like that one right there. That vesicle fuses with the cis Golgi, and then this protein moves through the cis, the, the medial, the trans Golgi network, and eventually gets to the plasma membrane. And as it's going th through this Golgi network, as many other proteins do that go through the secretory pathway, Sugars are attached to it. Glycosylation is very important for the function and stability of proteins, and they are added. And you can see here, as this protein is moving through, it's oligomerizing, sugars are trimmed, 
Uh, N-acetylglucosamine is added, galactose, even HA has some sialic acid on it. So these are all very specific additions as they move through. And the final protein has disulfide bonds and glycosylation sites, you can see by those branch structures there. Question one, subassemblies are involved in which of the following types of virus particle production? We have concerted assembly, sequential assembly, assembly lines, chaperone-assisted assembly, or all of the above? Well, the answer is all of the above, as, as many of you got, E. I, so concerted assembly is, is certainly involved. Sequential assembly is certainly involved. But assembly lines are also part of every assembly. Even the influenza sequence I showed you had a sequence of events. Even though it's concerted to form the virus particle, there are still, and I think I pointed out that there are still assembly line concepts there. And of course, chaperone, everyone recognized that. So it's all of the above. Let's talk about getting the viral genome into the particle. This is what we call packaging of the genome, genome packaging. And the problem, of course, is that you don't want to package cellular nucleic acids, whether it be DNA or RNA. They're, all, they're everywhere, so how does the virus particle distinguish? And the, the answer is packaging signals. These are signals on the viral genome that direct only that genome to be packaged into virus particles. So let's take a look at how these work. Here are some packaging signals for DNA genomes. Uh, we have two different DNA viruses, adenovirus and SV40 shown here. So let's start at the top adenovirus. We have the left end of the viral double-stranded DNA. There's an inverted terminal repeat. There's one at each end. The origin of replication is there. That's where the polymerase is going to bind to start DNA replication. 500 bases away, there's the promoter for E1A, that first protein that needs to be made in order to get DNA replication started. And in between is the packaging signal. It's actually a complicated set of repeated and overlapping sequences. These are identified by mutation. You make changes in this region and it will block the DNA from getting into the virus particle. So basically there are a number of these packaging signals. You could take this block of adenovirus DNA and put it into another DNA and that would get packaged into the virus particle. And this is important. If you want to make vectors for gene therapy, say you want to use adenovirus or some other virus to deliver a therapeutic gene to someone who's lacking it, you have to know where the packaging signals are because you have to add them to your therapeutic genes so it would be packaged into adenovirus particles or whatever virus you're working with. And that will be something we come back to at the end when we talk about gene therapy. That's the packaging signal for DNA. Adenovirus is pretty complicated. Now we have SV40 below it. There to orient you is the origin of replication. Remember this is a circular double-stranded DNA. We have, here's the early transcription unit in yellow, so this is going to lead to the synthesis of T antigen mRNA as soon as this virus gets in the cell. You also see the origin of replication there. That's where T antigen is going to bind and melt and attract the DNA polymerase apparatus. And look, right next to it is the packaging signal. So it's this sequence shown by the arrows. Happens to overlap with a series of binding sites for a transcription factor called SP1. This is a cellular transcription factor which is involved in the transcription of that early unit there. And there's even an enhancer on the other side of the packaging signal. So again, these are sequence, specific sequences in the viral DNA that are recognized by viral proteins, which will then direct the DNA protein into the capsid at the right stage of infection. And that's illustrated in the lower right here. We have a adenovirus empty capsid that has been put together this happens in the nucleus, and the viral DNA, in turn, is bound by a viral protein called 4A2. It recognizes the packaging sequence. So 4A2 will bind the packaging sequence, and then 4A2 is recognized by the capsid, and that brings the DNA into the capsid. So only DNA that's bound 4A2 will get in the capsid, and 4A2 will only bind the DNA packaging signal in the viral genome. So that's what makes it specific for adenovirus DNA. No cellular DNA can get in because it doesn't have the adenovirus packaging sequence. So similar principle for all the other DNA viruses. There's some specific sequence that a viral protein binds 
which then brings it into the capsid. Here's an example for herpes. It is so cool, I want to show you this, even though it's the same principle as, as adenovirus. Remember that herpes viruses replicate their genome by rolling circle, right? You make long concatamers of genomes by this method. This circle just keeps replicating and replicating. It's like a roll of toilet paper, if you will. Uh, you know, someone told me that after a class one year. You should say it's like toilet paper. I said, not the best analogy, but there you go. It's toilet paper. You have a roll and you keep pulling it off and you rip the pieces and each piece is a genome. Think of it that way. So you have many genomes on this toilet paper. Uh, of course, there's no roll here. It's just made all the time. So that's why I don't like the analogy. Anyway, you got lots of genome length. So all these have to be packaged and they're not cut before they're packaged. They get cut during the packaging sequence. Here on the next panel, A, there is a diagram of the viral DNA, the whole thing at the top, and then the left end is amplified or expanded below it. And all these sequences here, DR1, PAC, DR2, PAC2, DR1, these are the packaging signals for herpes virus DNA. They're actually also present uh, at the right end of the genome as well. You can see it's in the A sequence, which is blue, and at either end. These are the signals, PAC1 and PAC2, that are needed to recognize the viral DNA and, and cleave it. And what does that mean? So let's go here to the packaging sequence on the right. So in step one, we have our empty capsid, which is in the nucleus. It doesn't have any DNA in it. It has a portal at one end. That portal recognizes a number of proteins that bind to these PAC sequences, PAC1, 2, DR1, and 2. So these red and white and green proteins, they interact with the portal and with the packaging signal on the viral DNA. So when this interaction happens, it's again a specific sequence interaction, it's happening at the A sequence, but this is part of a longer molecule, right? There's still concatamers. Then the portal starts to wind the DNA into the interior of the capsid. So there's an energy dependent reaction which pulls the DNA in. You can see it's pulling it in step three, there's more DNA. And when the portal encounters another set of these packaging direct repeat DR sequences, the uh, winding of the DNA stops at step three. And then the DNA is cleaved by an endonuclease associated with the portal. Now we have what we call a head full of DNA. It's, it's a complete genome. And then there's another bit out here that could bind another capsid and be imported into that as well. Okay, so you see how the packaging gives it specificity because it's only DNA with this packaging sequence that will bind the proteins to allow interaction with the portal. And not only that, the sequences allow recognition by the portal to know when there's a whole genome in the capsid, because it sees, oh, here's another repeat cut, and that's it. And now you have the full genome in there, and then the rest of the concatamer is here. You can see the, the cut has been sealed off there. It's been ligated, and that can go into another capsid. So this is a very cool way of getting packaging of DNA, and it uses the portal, uh, which I wanted to show you. So RNA viruses, of course, also have packaging signals. They're not as well worked out as for DNA viruses for reasons that are not quite clear. It's been really hard to identify them, but they have to exist because RNA viruses only package viral genomes. So for example, poliovirus, no one has ever been able to say where in this genome is there a sequence that allows only polio RNA to get in the capsid. That still is an unanswered question. However, for retroviruses, people have made advances. And here's an example for HIV-1, which involves a packaging sequence at the left end of the RNA. So here on the lower left is just the very five prime end of the viral RNA. This would be what is in the virus particle. So it's made by transcription of the proviral DNA in the nucleus, comes out in the cytoplasm and eventually will get incorporated into the virus particle. There is a packaging sequence uh, here shown by the arrow, and that's uh, called a psi sequence for packaging. And if you 
change this. If you mutate it in some way, you will disrupt packaging. It's necessary, but it's not enough. If you take this and put it in another mRNA, it's not enough to get it packaged. So it's necessary, but not sufficient. This sequence has highly structured RNA in it, as you can see here. It has a number of stem loops. In fact, it has four stem loops. And what we think happens is when two molecules of RNA come together, these two are going to be packaged into the viral DNA. This loop here in red of, it, of stem loop one base pairs with the same loop on another RNA. So now we have what's called a kissing loop complex. So the two loops of the stem loop one are base pairing, and this provides some of the uh, adhesion between the two RNAs so they're pulled into the virus particle together. Now that base pairing, in addition, allows for high affinity binding of a protein, nucleoprotein, which is shown on the upper right. And that nucleoprotein is going to bring this RNA into the virus particle. So the nucleoprotein is part of the gag protein precursor that is made during infection that consists of the matrix protein, again, the protein that makes a shell around the capsid. There's the capsid protein. There's the nucleocapsid. So that's gag. It's made as a precursor. And the precursor binds RNA via this kissing loop. And here is the nucleocapsid expanded to show you these specific RNA binding domains in this protein. These are regions that, when changed by mutation, will ab abrogate binding of this protein to the viral RNA. And what happens is that the nucleocapsid is part of a, a gag precursor. It's not yet cleaved so that the proteins are separate. And you can see that in this lower panel here we have blue matrix proteins, uh, then we have capsid next, then we have nucleocapsid, and then a, a few other proteins, including the protease, that's going to eventually cleave this. And you can see the nucleocapsid is binding uh, the RNA. So there are high affinity binding sites created by this. Then the nucleocapsid can bind elsewhere as well. And as you'll see in a moment, this is then brought into the virus particle. So that's the packaging signal. It gives not only the ability to have two RNAs in the particle, but to attract this protein, which will bring it in, very much like the other proteins brought in DNA genomes, as we have discussed. An additional interesting problem is if you have a virus with segments, influenza virus has eight segments, rheoviruses have 10 or more, but never more than 12, right? Because there are only 12 fivefold axes of symmetry. How do you make sure that you get all eight or 10 or whatever into a particle? Because if you don't get them all in, they're not going to be infectious. So if, let's take influenza virus. It's got eight segments. If you only put seven in, it won't be infectious. If you only put six or less, they're not going to be infectious. If the right number, not only eight, but they have to be eight unique segments, right? one through eight. They can't be eight copies of segment one. So this is a daunting problem. And some people have done some math, and they've come up with this idea that if you just threw eight segments randomly into an influenza virus particle, you say you have a pool of segments in a cell, and you just grab eight, you get a lot of non-infectious non particles. But actually, you would get at a rate of 1 in 400 an infectious particle just by random pulling of eight out of a pool. And that happens to be near the particle to PFU ratio of influenza virus. Only about 1 in 400 particles are infectious. And it may be, some people thought for many years, that it was just a random packaging event. But now there is evidence that there are actually sequences at the ends of these RNA segments that direct this process. And it's more ordered than just a, a random process as well. And I'll show you a little bit of the structure of that here on this slide. So here on the right are the eight influenza virus RNA segments. They each encode uh, different proteins. You can see one encodes the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. The yellow is the coding region of each RNA. And at the ends, there are blue sequences of different lengths. Those are the packaging sequences. And we think that those not only engage with proteins, which ones in particular, not yet sorted out with proteins that allow incorporation of the virus particles. But they also allow RNA-RNA interactions so that you get the right eight RNAs in a particle. And so people have done experiments. For example, you can take the signals at the ends of the HA and the NS and swap them 
and you will still get infectivity because they will direct those corresponding segments into the virus particle. So again, the idea is that these sequences bind a protein that gets the, the RNAs incorporated into the particle, but they also bind other RNAs so that you get the right eight segments into a virus particle. The exact mechanism isn't quite sorted out yet, but what we do know is that if you take sections of influenza virus particles on the lower left here, here's an electron micrograph, it looks like the RNA segments are always parallel in the particle, because you can see them as little circles there. So it's thought that the budding process occurs in an ordered way, and that's shown on the top. You have the budding just beginning. There's a little, these are HA and NAs in the plasma membrane, and the eight segments have all aligned in parallel, presumably via protein, RNA, and RNA interactions, and they will bud in this manner. So to summarize this, even though random packaging could explain the infectivity of the influenza virus, there is probably a specific mechanism like this one. Some RNA viruses have what we call selective packaging. This is very interesting. So here is a bacteriophage, Phi6, that has three double-stranded RNA segments. They're called S, M, and L, and there on the upper left is the diagram. These are like real viruses that have a double Capsid, they have an outer shell and an inner shell. But here are the three double-stranded RNAs, a big one, a medium-sized one, and a small one. And these have a serial dependence of packaging. So the capsid is formed, and first, the small segment goes in with signals that haven't been sorted out, but nothing else goes in first. To an empty capsid, S goes in first. Then once S is there, M comes in next, and only M, no more S's and no L. And then once S and M are there, the L segment gets in. So that's serial dependence of packaging, it means that you don't package until you have the preceding segment in. Now this virus has a particle to PFU ratio of one, which means that almost every particle made is infectious, and that may be because it has such an efficient packaging mechanism. Why this isn't the same in other viruses, I don't know but it certainly is in some of them, and it works very well. The next question is, packaging signals on viral blank interact with viral blank during virus assembly. Lipids and proteins, proteins and subassemblies, genomes and proteins, proteases and membranes, proteins and genomes. So the answer, which 68% of you got, packaging signals on viral genomes interact with viral proteins during virus assemble, assembly. Now, a lot of you picked proteins and genomes, but the packaging signals are on the, the genome, not on the protein, okay? That's the definition of a packaging signal. Last step is to talk about viruses that acquire an envelope or a membrane uh, via budding at some cellular site. And uh, most enveloped viruses do this after the internal structures are assembled. So influenza virus, the ribonucleoproteins form in the nucleus, they go up to the plasma membrane and then it buds out. And what drives the budding can be a variety of different proteins. Here, for example, in this, this example, the glycoproteins and the capsid are both needed for budding for some viruses. So you put the glycoproteins in the membrane, the capsid is formed intracellularly, cytoplasmically for this RNA virus, comes up, and those two together drive the budding. For some viruses, it's just the matrix or the capsid protein alone that will drive budding. You can express the gag protein of retroviruses and they will form empty particles in an uninfected cell. So they alone can drive budding. Sometimes envelope proteins will drive budding. There is a flu vaccine, a new flu vaccine that's being tested. And you should get flu vaccine, by the way, because 50,000 people are gonna die of flu this year because most of them not vaccinated and most of them are healthy. A new flu vaccine that's in testing, which is made uh, in plants by just making the HA protein. And that's enough to drive the production of vesicles, membrane vesicles that can be purified and used as a vaccine. So the HA alone can drive the budding of particles. And then there are some viruses where you need matrix proteins and something else, a glycoprotein or, or even RNP to get efficient budding. But this one, type three, is great because you can make vaccines very easily for these viruses. Non-infectious vaccines, we call these virus-like particle vaccines, and they can be very effective. 
the ones that are being made for flu that are being tested are made in tobacco because tobacco is genetically manipulable and it's cheap and you can get 20,000 doses of vaccine in a square meter of tobacco plants. But I, I am anticipating the vaccine lecture. We'll talk about that later. Now, influenza virus budding. This is one example. Remember, concerted assembly. We talked about how the ribonuclear protein is assembled in the nucleus. It's exported. It's transported to the membranes. And in the slide I showed you last time, it was just floating up to the plasma membrane. But of course, it doesn't uh, do that. Uh, it is transported actually on membranous vesicles. These RNPs interact with membranous vesicles, which then get transported up on microtubules. Just like endosomes get transported in, these RNPs get transported up and they meet the plasma membrane where there are now some viral glycoproteins being inserted after being brought there, of course, by the secretory pathway. This is a detail of budding of influenza virus at the top, so we can actually see the particle being made. So we brought the ribonuclear protein to the plasma membrane. And remember, the HA alone is enough to stimulate this budding process. But nevertheless, the RNP gets targeted to the plasma membrane. The membrane begins to pinch out, and eventually it pinches off, and the virus particle is formed. So that's budding, and this is at the plasma membrane. Now, the M1 protein is important for targeting the RNP to the plasma membrane. Here's a schematic of the M1 protein. And you can see, first of all, it has a nuclear export sequence that helps it get out of the nucleus. Remember, it's binding the RNP in the nucleus, it helps it get out. And here are some hydrophobic regions that will target it to the membrane. There are lots of other sequences in here. For example, this part of the protein is important for binding to the ribonuclear protein. But this hydrophobic part up front, it says lipid binding, that part of the M1 is what's targeting it to the plasma membrane. So this is not a signal sequence mediated membrane interaction, it's just mediated by a hydrophobic sequence that engages lipids. Similar story with the VSVM protein, which has a, a similar uh, role. It doesn't bring it out of the nucleus, it doesn't bring the RNA out of the nucleus, it's made in the cytoplasm, but it binds the RNA, brings it to the plasma membrane, and here we have, an, again, a hydrophobic region which is involved in membrane binding. And also the N-terminus uh, is involved in binding to the actual RNP itself. So these are two examples of protein targeting to membranes not involving a signal sequence, but involving hydrophobic parts uh, of the proteins. Here is a budding process of a retrovirus, which has some key differences I want to tell you. There, there are principles as well. Remember the RNA is formed by transcription of the proviral DNA in the nucleus. Uh, they come out into the cytoplasm, so unspliced RNA export using the mechanism we talked about earlier. Uh, the RNA is dimerized by that kissing loop interaction, and then they bind gag proteins. Uh, we, we looked at this before, but there in, in the white circle is the nucleocapsid. Here's GAG on the right. There's nucleocapsid. It is binding the RNA, and it brings with it matrix protein, capsid, and a, and a variety of other proteins as well. Uh, and these are targeted to the plasma membrane. We'll see how uh, in a moment. Remember that the GAG is translated from the N-terminus of the mRNA, and then there's a stop code on after the GAG protein. So you mostly make GAG. You have to suppress the stop codon in, in order to get a longer protein that includes the reverse transcriptase. And that is shown there. This is the product of the longer protein made by suppression of a stop codon. Not only do you have matrix capsid, nucleocapsid, we now have protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase. So every so often, one of those monomers will go into the growing crescent Remember, we looked at this crescent growing earlier with the aid of chaperones. That starts to bud out. Of course, it's already got glycoproteins from the secretory pathway. It starts to bud out. And you can see how this grabs the RNA. The RNA is binding nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid is attached covalently still to the, the other proteins in GAG. The virus particle buds off. And then the protease cleaves these gag proteins, the particle matures, and you can see it goes to a mature particle. So the maturation of this particular retrovirus is happening externally. So the cleavage of those proteins, formation of the capsid, the release of the individual RT and integrase, all that happens after the virus has butted off. And here's how matrix is targeted to the plasma membrane. Matrix, again, is that blue protein 
that's attached to GAG. It brings all the other proteins and the RNA to the plasma membrane. It's targeted by an N-terminal meristate, which is a lipid covalently attached to the N-terminal amino acid of the GAG protein, the matrix part of the GAG protein. So there's the GAG protein, and the meristate is shown as the jagged line. It's attached to a glycine right at the N-terminus, and that directs the GAG protein to the plasma membrane. If you change the sequence of this protein so that it cannot be meristoylated, so the meristate can't be attached, you will not get assembly because the GAG cannot reach the plasma membrane. So another example of membrane targeting without a signal sequence, we saw for flu and, and VSV a hydrophobic sequence in the protein, and now we have the addition of a lipid, meristate. And just as a repetition here is nucleocapsid with its RNA binding domains, and that's of course how the RNA is brought into this growing budding particle. This is meristate, by the way. It's a lipid that allows targeting to membranes, and this is typically attached to a, a glycine in a protein, and there's some signals involved in that as well. So these, are, these get added in the cytoplasm, these lipids, and other virus proteins are modified uh, with lipids as well for similar and different purposes. One more word about budding. Budding is not something invented by viruses. As you might guess, this is a cellular process. Our cells are always budding off little vesicles all the time in the form of exosomes and other kinds of vesicles that contain molecules to be sent elsewhere. So there's a whole cellular apparatus that is already made to send vesicles off from the plasma membrane, and viruses have simply tapped into that. The way this was discovered was a number of years ago, a number of laboratories were making mutations in the gene encoding the GAG protein. Here we have HIV in a, in a mouse retrovirus GAG protein. And in particular for HIV, mutations in this little protein called P6 gave an interesting phenotype that the virus particles would start to bud and then they would be arrested at a late stage. And you see they would be still attached to the cell by these stems. They look like grapes attached to the cells, membrane tethers. So again, this is by changing amino acids in the, the very C-terminal part of, of GAG for HIV and a different part of GAG for the mouse retrovirus. So these were called late domains of the viral proteins because they affected a late step in maturation. And then since their discovery in retroviruses, they've been found in many envelope viruses of both plus and minus strand RNA genomes. And it turns out what these proteins do, these P6 here and the P12, they bind cell proteins involved in the generation of the budding envelope. So there's a whole cellular pathway, the escort pathway, that is designed for budding of membrane vesicles at the cell surface, within the cell, and some of these proteins are shown here. Here's the escort 3 protein, escort 1, and these proteins, the viral proteins involved to bind these and therefore bring the virus into these already occurring budding pathways. Here is the escort pathway at work. It stands for endosomal sorting complex is required for transport. So, you know, when cells divide, there's a membrane bridge between the cells that has to be broken. It's called abscission. And escort is involved in that and breaking it off. There are also many steps in the pathway where membranes have to fuse, vesicles have to fuse with other vesicles. This is all mediated by the escort pathway. So what the viruses have evolved to do is they have proteins that bind members of these escort pathways. They direct the escort machinery to the cell surface where the virus then will bud off. And that pinching off of that bud is catalyzed entirely by escort proteins, which normally would be functioning at other parts of the cell. So it's just like everything else, viruses don't invent things in the cell when they can take advantage of what's already there. Budding, it can happen at pretty much every membrane uh, in the cell. We've talked about viruses budding from the plasma membrane, but there are viruses that bud uh, from the nuclear membrane. There are viruses that bud from the ER membrane, and there are viruses that bud from the Golgi. They can bud in different places, and getting to the surface is a bit of a challenge when you bud from other than the plasma membrane. 
Uh, which statement about budding is wrong, is incorrect? The envelope can be acquired before or simultaneous with assembly of internal components. The viral spike glycoprotein can drive budding. No host proteins are involved in budding. Uh, lipids assist structural proteins to interact with the membrane. The viral membrane can be acquired from the nucleus, ER, Golgi, or plasma membrane. Which one's wrong? Most of you got C, no host proteins are involved. That's a ringer. Whenever it says no or never, you can always almost assume that's wrong because it's never no or never in biology, right? All the other things are right. Now, how does herpes get out of the cell? This is very interesting because herpes buds through the nuclear membrane. So let's go to the nucleus right here. The capsid forms in the nucleus, buds out of the nuclear membrane. That puts it in the ER. Now it has a lovely membrane up, but then it fuses with the outer ER and now is in the cytoplasm. It's lost its membrane. So what are we going to do? Okay, now it buds into the trans-Golgi. It's got a membrane. So if, it just, if that membrane just fused with the Golgi, it would lose it again. If it doesn't, it gets encased in a vesicle. And the vesicle brings it to the surface. And now this is exocytosis. And that brings the virus out with a membrane. And in the process, you see it's, it's accumulating these tegument proteins, which include VP16, the transcriptional uh, activator that we talked about. And these are nice EM pictures of every budding step that have been seen in the cell. So that's one way that you keep your membrane by going through a little bit of contortions. Budding, obviously, is a way to release particles from the cell. I want you to keep that in mind because whether the virus buds at any of the internal membranes, eventually it's got to get out at the plasma membrane, and now we have free virus particles. During the transport process, other things can happen that are very interesting. And here, for example, we have dengue virus, which you may remember is an enveloped virus with a glycoprotein, a trimer glycoprotein, which is embedded in the envelope. As this particle goes through the secretory pathway, ER, Golgi, up to the membrane, the pH of this pathway drops. So the ER is about 7, and then the pH goes down to 6 in the trans-Golgi network. And that's important for the virus to mature. As the virus is first produced, it's called immature, the glycoproteins are actually sticking up. Remember, they're normally flat on the virus particle. They're sticking up, and also they have this blue protein called PR. Uh, M on it, and that, that needs to be removed to expose the fusion peptide eventually. So as this virus particle goes through the secretory pathway, the low pH causes the proteins to flatten on the virus particle. You can see there, labeled TGN, they're flat. That exposes a scissors cleavage site on this protein. It's a furin, is a protease that will cleave off the blue proteins. So now the mature virus particle has lost these blue proteins, which are protecting the fusion peptides, which are shown there in red. And now when this virus infects a new cell, it encounters low pH. The low pH will bring up the glycoproteins, but now the fusion protein will be exposed at the top. And this immature conformation this is not infectious because the fusion protein is capped with this blue protein. Another way to make sure fusion occurs in the right place. Envelope viruses are released from this cell by budding, but there's a cool twist with vaccinia virus. Not only is the virus released, but the cells push it away from the cell. And here we have vaccinia virus maturing and being transported up along the microtubule. It's in a double membrane configuration. So this outer membrane fuses with the plasma membrane. And then we have these particles, these vaccinia particles. They, they tend to remain on the cell surface, but they interact with receptors, this X protein here. And that, actually, that interaction triggers a signaling cascade that causes actin polymerization. And that's happening here. And eventually, they, the cell forms these long pseudopodia, which effectively push the virus towards the neighboring cell. And that's what's happening there. So not just budding, but propulsion away from the cell. And you can see pictures of that here. Here's an infected cell uh, where the actin is stained in green. And you can see the red virus particles on the actin tips. And on the right is, a, is another photograph, an EM, of the actin tails propelling the vaccinia particle there away from the cell. So some cool twists can happen at the end.
What about uh, non-envelope viruses? How do they get out of cells? So the membrane is easy. The bud from the surface or they're released in vesicles. Most of the time, non-envelope viruses, uh, the cells die. They either go through apoptosis or necroptosis. They break up uh, and, the cell and the virus particles are released. We know that sometimes if there are viral proteins that actually induce the rupture of cell membranes, they're called viral porins. And viruses, as you will see next time, inhibit protein synthesis in the cell, and this leads to a loss of membrane integrity. So all of these factors lead into the ability of a non-envelope virus to just get out of a broken cell, basically. However, there are some interesting pathways about which we are learning more by which non-envelope viruses can actually leave the cell in vesicles. And the example here is at the top. Poliovirus infection induces double membrane vesicles by the autophagy pathway on which the virus replicates its RNA. Later in infection, those double membrane vesicles actually encase virus particles. That's the function in autophagy, to take the cytoplasm and recycle it out at the cell surface. So if there are viral particles there, they get encased and they get released by this exocytosis. And as I said earlier, cells are always spitting off membranous vesicles, and there's evidence that viruses can be incorporated into these membranous vesicles and leave by exosomes as well. So not only can non-envelope particles leave by killing cells, but they can be released in these vesicles. Now, so far, we have talked mainly about viruses and what they do to get themselves replicated. Next time, I want to talk about the, the effects that a virus infection has on the cell, and that'll be our last discussion of the reproductive cycle before moving into pathogenesis.